This Week in Startups is brought to you by Klaviyo. Klaviyo is the e-commerce marketing platform that helps brands build relationships with memorable email and SMS messages. Over 40,000 brands choose Klaviyo to help them grow. Learn more and get started with a free trial at klaviyo.com slash twist. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash twist. Fiverr. Find the perfect freelance services for your business. Go to fiverr.com and use code twist to receive 10% off your first order. And Dell for entrepreneurs. Level up your hardware today and save up to 43% by going to launch.co slash Dell. Hey, everybody. It's a really special day here on This Week in Startups because today I want to share with you one of the great life lessons I've learned, which is play the long game. In life, you work hard and you meet a lot of people and you treat everybody you meet with respect and you try to support everybody you can to the greatest extent possible. This is why I have some of the greatest friendships uh, in my life that I've ever had at the age of 49. Because every time I meet somebody and I make a friendship, I just say, I'm going to go all in on this. That's my uh, feeling with my team members here at launch and inside. If you're on my team, I'm going all in. I'm going to support you forever uh, if you're in good standing. Uh, if you <laughs> are a friend, I'm going to be loyal. I'm going to do whatever it takes to help you succeed in your life and be there for you and listen. I call this radical friendship. I call it radical partnership. I just put the word radical in front of these relationships because why not? If you've chosen to have this person in your life, why not radically support them? And a number of years ago, I think it's getting on a decade, a group from New Hampshire from a company called Dyn, D-Y-N.com, Dyn. And I knew them because they helped me route my DNS for my home video cameras uh, back in the day. They wrote me a very pleasant note and said, hey, would you join our board? We're thinking about raising around. We need an independent board member. And uh, I said, uh, uh, and, they, and they shared with me, they were making like, I don't know, $20 million, $15, 20000000 million. And then their EBITDA was like $14 million and a I wrote back, I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. You're saying this is how much you've raised? Or you're saying this is how much you make? And they said, no, that's what we make. We've raised zero dollars. And I, and I said, okay, when can you meet? They're like, well, we're in San Francisco next week. I said, well, when do you land? They said, Tuesday. I said, meet me at Fang uh, over by the Moscone Center next to the W Hotel. It's great, great, great uh, Asian food, a Asian fusion. Uh, you want to get the duck pancakes over there. Incredible. I, it, just fantastic. And uh, we said, I joined the board. I get to the board meeting and I meet a gentleman named Rick Fulham. And he is one of the smartest, kindest, most thoughtful people I ever meet. Again, a random series of events. And then that gentleman, Rick and I develop a friendship. We spend a little time together on uh, Nantucket. Do they call that the rock, Rick? Is that what they call the rock or they call, they call it the rock, right? Yeah. We spend a little time, we get along, we vibe, we talk for hours. And just one day, Rick says, I'm starting something new. I'd like you involved. I say, great. Where do I send the check? Because I know Rick's going to win because he's a winner. That's all you need to know in life. And uh, Rick says, okay, here. And I say, can I get twice that amount? Rick says, hey, J. Cal, I'm oversubscribed. I'm like, can I take three times that amount? <laughs> anyway, he gets me a tiny little slice of something I know nothing about, 3D printing. What does J. Cal know about 3D printing? I know nothing. All I know is that Rick Fulop is one of the great human beings I've met in my life. As a human being, as a technologist, and as a leader of companies. And I am so delighted to have my good friend Rick Fulop on the program to talk about desktop metal because Rick just spacked desktop metal. And now we have to have a little disclaimer here. We cannot talk about certain things. Rick, I don't know all the rules of the road, but first I want to congratulate you on the uh, tremendous success you've had with Desktop Metal to date. And I've had three companies that I've invested in go public now. Um, Uber, Waiter, we had a couple of shares we got in that. It was kind of de minimis, so I don't, it doesn't really count, but I guess it counts technically because they bought one of our companies. And now Desktop Metal. So thank you for including me in the journey 
you, you, you didn't have to, you were oversubscribed and you just saved a little slice for, for your boy J-Cal. And that's all I ask any of my friends, just save a slice for J-Cal. I don't, need, I don't need three slices. I may ask for three, but I'll take one. One slice, everybody knows the rules. Uh, Rick, congratulations uh, on, on, on doing the SPAC. Let's start um, with number one, what is desktop metal? And number two, why did you choose this moment to do a SPAC and explain the process? And we'll get into that here in the first segment. Yeah, so Desktop Metal is one of the leading providers of metal 3D printers. We make uh, machines that make it really easy to print metal parts at scale, uh, which is something that you couldn't really do easily before uh, we came along. You had this legacy technology that used lasers and special facilities and was quite complicated. And we've uh, made that technology a lot more accessible and, and uh, friendly to, to the mass market and uh, uh, today, it's used by hundreds of companies globally, many Fortune 500 companies uh, to make metal parts, and uh, we're entering the composite space as well. We've got uh, one of the leading uh, performance uh, uh, continuous fiber composite uh, systems in the market. Uh, so uh, we, we uh, make it easier to make stuff. Is And are know. those machines behind you, for those of us watching on the YouTube channel or on the video version of the podcast, which, uh, by the way, our video version should be on Spotify uh, any awesome. day now, thanks to to my uh, my friends Daniel Eck and everybody over at Spotify. Shout out to Spotify for including us and everything. Um, are those the machines behind you? What are the cost of these machines? These are not three D printers for people at home to build Star Wars characters or ornaments and toys. These are metal printers to print components for what type of companies for what type of application. And the cost of them. Yeah. I mean, I think that our, our most accessible systems start at 3500 bucks a year, which, which are in the composite space. But um, on the, on the uh, uh, metal side, they start around 160000 and they go all the way up to $2 million when it's fully loaded for the mass production system. So we have a, a full range of, of technologies. Uh, the SME products are, are kind of in the range of a high-end CNC machine. So they're very affordable. If, if you're a shop that... Uh, Can you explain what that means? Uh, uh, two words, composite and CNC. Yeah, so CNC is a milling system. So uh, just go, just type in CNC on YouTube and you'll see. <laughs> you'll, you won't be this able to like This is how people that. used to make metal parts. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Got yeah it. exactly. Yeah. yeah. A and it means cutting the metal as opposed to printing the metal. Am I correct? That's right. That's okay. totally right. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Uh, people would previously use these giant machines cut metal. Or they uh, would cast. They would make a mold and cast a part. Oh, and yes. Would, yeah. And that is incredibly costly and time-consuming. Totally. Yeah, it's slow. Yeah. Many yeah. weeks to get a part from a... You know, just to get the mold to then, like, you got to amortize a mold over many parts. So the, the cost is, is prohibitive for uh, a short run. And doing it digitally, it's revolutionary. And you could do a lot more geometry than you could have done otherwise. And th these are systems that are used by everybody from, like, Honda, Nissan, Toyota, Ford, uh, BMW, these are your customers. Yeah, yeah. What so would an automaker made. use these for? Would they, if you were building a new BMW, they wouldn't be using these for the BMW that I would that I would drive. But maybe if they were making a BMW prototype, instead of doing a mold, waiting eight weeks or six weeks and going through that expense, they could try a couple of different variations on a brake or a, a, totally. a, 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 a what? What would they print as an example of putting aside BMW or any specific person, an automaker? Actually, Jason, so, so automotive is maybe 20% of our business. So mm. it's not a, a massive side of the business, but it's, it's significant. We don't have account concentration. It's, it's a, a pretty horizontal business. It's not lumpy, which is actually a great, great feature of the business. Uh, but w we actually make systems for mass production. So uh, really, our large machines can print hundreds of metric tons of, of parts per year. It's, it's incredible. They, they're, it's like a printing press for metal. Wow. So that is yeah. mind blowing on a number of levels because you've taken what would have been the iteration product process, if, if, I, if I'm understanding correctly, and I, and, and I am yeah. a, a neophyte, and you've combined the iteration process with the mass production process, and now it is one thing. That and, and also the fact that, that now you can have physics define the shape of the part. Today, we do a lot of things based on the manufacturing process, but if you free yourself uh, from the constraints of manufacturing uh, processes, you could have what's called generative design, where the 
physics of a, or not, that an object will be uh, exposed to end up uh, uh, determining the shape of the part. And, and as a result, you end up with these things that look like they're bionic or, or uh, you know, uh, from outer space, but they're a lot more efficient, lighter weight, much greener. And so it's uh, definitely uh, the wave of the future. And so this iterative process, uh, I always see as an example, there are a some people get crazy with their cars and they're trying to reduce weight, but increase uh, the stability of the car. So they will replace stock parts, whether it's like the pedals with pedals that have, you know, I don't know, half the amount of weight, but twice the strength or, or, or something to that effect. This has this type of iteration has never existed before therefore you know the the iteration process of reducing the weight of the pedals or some other part to increase the fuel efficiency of an ev or a gas car you know an ice engine th these things were were just not bothered with right it was kind of like why even bother yeah i mean when you when you went to precision machine design class in mechanical engineering or or anything like that you would um you know they usually uh, suggest that you start with uh, a simple shape uh, or two and a half D shapes is and uh, that's that's uh, sort of a, uh, the old way of thinking and and if you don't have constraints and you can make any shape then uh, uh, you know you could have also almost like artificial intelligence determine what's the optimal uh, oh my lord you know, Look, that's mind yeah, which is actually incredible we're going to cover yeah. some of the ai plus the printing and some more of the use cases of desktop metal uh, which you can totally. follow on twitter at desktop metal and then in segment three we're going to talk about the spac when we get back on the swing startups all right if you're growing an e-commerce business and that's your focus you need a platform that is focused on growth and that platform is clavio k-l-a-v-i-y-o and it is the ultimate e-commerce marketing platform for online brands of all kinds and sizes. Whether you're just getting started or you're running a well-known brand, it gives you everything you need to send memorable branded emails. So those branded emails are very specific to each user. And you get to also send text messages and more. So you build that strong brand relationship that keeps your customers coming back with flexible automations, powerful insights, and super precise targeting. That's the key, that targeting. Clavio is the faster way to turn great ideas into great customer experiences. That's why it's trusted by over 40,000 brands like Living Proof, Huckberry, and even 8sleep, which I'm an investor in. Great, great bed, by the way. And you know, if you wanna target those ads to the right person, you might have differences uh, based upon things you've learned about them in your data sets, and you wanna craft those messages, and Clavio will help you craft those messages. Just visit Clavio, K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash twist and get started today with a free trial for our listeners. Clavio dot com slash twist. All right, it's a very special edition of this week in startups. You've all been hearing about SPACs, special purpose acquisition corporations, companies? Yeah. Is it companies or corporations? I don't even know. It's the same word. It's, uh, it's a vehicle. It's a vehicle to go public, and you guys have chosen to do that, and I believe that was announced on Wednesday, August 26th. Am I correct? Yeah. So that was announced. We'll talk about that in the next segment. Right now, I want people to understand more about the use cases of desktop metal. Uh, full disclosure, <laughs> yum, yum for Jake Al. I was able to invest in this. Uh, and uh, it's a third uh, company to go public for me, which is a really big deal uh, because most investors and venture capitalists and angels, they, they, they don't see one IPO in their career. And, and I'm putting up numbers already. And, and really, I, I can't thank you enough uh, for including me on the journey. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Oh, thanks, pal. I appreciate it. Uh, and many and many more to go, hopefully, uh, as, as we both uh, continue on our friendship and career. If, if, if you don't remember this story, uh, I was coming down to see uh, the, the folks that ended up investing in the Series A and, and all hotels were sold out and you let me crash in your place. Is that uh, right? Oh, that's yeah. right. And I made you a brisket. <laughs> did I make a yes. brisket? What did I make? I it was good. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> oh, I think I may have I done remember. a tomahawk yeah. chop. Yeah. So anyway, just for those VCs who are listening, you lazy bastards, man, this is why I run circles around a lot of you because when a founder's in town, all I tell them is SFO, my house, here's the directions, here's the master, the second master suite, you know, hey, listen, yeah. I'm blowing it out now. And then I just I immediately get me a brisket. I call my assistant, get a brisket. Boom. We get that brisket going. We slice it up and then we stay up. We eat the brisket. 
and we talk and we talk yeah. and we talk and we talk and you know you know uh, our mutual friend rob may when he comes yeah. out uh i told rob may if you ever come to town and i see you on social media and you're staying at a hotel i am i am going to come to the hotel pick i'm going to pick you up and bring you to the house do not and this is to, to all my CEOs and friends, do not come to this town and not stay at the Cala compound. Um, but you were going to meet the VCs. We talked about it. We chopped it up. And uh, that was great. Let's get back to desktop metal. Uh, you, you, there is this concept of AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, you know, and then combining that with metal and printing of parts. Is there an example you can give us without t saying the name of the customer um, or a fantastical example, even better, of something that in 10 years you'd be able to do with AI that could have a dramatic impact on humanity. And, and you can yeah, take a I second think to think that through, because like, um, what I'm looking for is an example from now and an example that's so fantastical that our minds and our brains will melt. So, yeah, so, so today uh, products are basically an engineer, and I'm a longtime investor in CAD, so I, I, I think uh, one of my early mentors in the, in the sort of... Uh, venture and investing business. I, uh, so I did 15 years as an entrepreneur and five years as an investor. And in the investing side, I was one of the early backers of Onshape. We did the Series A of that, which we sold for 500 million to PTC. And we did uh, Proto Labs, which is a public company, 3.8 billion market cap today. And uh, we did also the Series A of Space Claim, which went to Ansys and um, Revit, which went to Autodesk. Uh, SolidWorks which became the so a 60% market share of, of the CAD software market. So CAD is like the software used to sketch parts and um, computer aided well, design. This is how right. three. This is how things are built in 3D on a computer and then manifest them in the real world. And 3D printers took this from you know from an abstraction. You know where one thing happened in one building, one thing in another, and they both happened in the same space in the same office. Exactly. So so. The sort of the history of CAD is uh, th there's a company called PTC in the 90s that made a parametric. And uh, parametric means that you change one thing and the whole thing reorganizes based on that change. And, and you know, uh, if you were uh, creating, uh, you know, everything is in, in, in context. Uh, and uh, there's references that, that re-update automatically when you change something. There's a history tree for the, for the design of the part. So in that type of mentality of, of designing product, you have a sketcher. And you're, you as an engineer are essentially drawing the, the shape of the part and you may do analysis to, to figure it out. But it's a relatively simplistic approach where there's no multiphysics context to what you're trying to design. And that means by multiphysics is all the things that are going to happen to that object from magnetics to heat to uh, friction to vibration to loads that you expose that part to. And so when you're making complex engineered products uh, today, the engineer is thinking about all that stuff in the context of his head. But uh, a product is an assembly of thousands of parts or hundreds of parts or dozens of parts. And so uh, if you had, let's say, a rocket and the entire rocket is designed uh, you know, to run analysis on the entire thing on a multiphysic basis would be quite complex because there's 100,000 parts in that device. Uh, and, and many engineers worked on their little parts of the design. Um, I would say a decade from now, we're going to have, uh, and I, I'm not talking about desktop metal. I'm just talking about engineering software today, but, uh, the, in the future, you're going to have all of the physics that the object is going to see defined and then the computer will do the design. Uh, and I know that there's a, if I asked the CEO of a few of the crowd companies, they wouldn't agree with me, but I think this is how it's going to play. Uh, and uh, the human is going to be essentially defining the requirements for the product and the, and the design of the product uh, is going to be done to some extent by the computer wow. uh, or, the, or, the, or the cloud system that you're exposing it to. And, you know, whether you take a, 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 there's something called assembly consolidation, which is a, a design technique where you take many parts today and then you print it as a single component, things of that nature. Uh, you'll be able to fully automate. And then once you have that in context of the other parts in a large system or a large product, uh, and you can expose them to like multi-physics analysis, uh, you'll be able to sort of adapt the shapes uh, in the context of the multi-physics problem. And that, that becomes, uh, that, that's a huge opportunity to, in, the, in the engineering software field.
Okay, again, I'm going to just ask my neophyte questions, uh, which is kind of my speciality on this podcast, because um, half the audience is much smarter than me, and, and then the other half of the audience is just, just like me trying to catch up with this. Jacob, yeah. there's no there's no software to do what I just described today. This yes. is where it's going to be in five years. And so, so, but, but you can do this in a small group of parts. Like you can get three parts in the context of themselves, right? But Got it. If you're trying to define a problem, say, here's a door of a uh -huh. car and it's going to be opening and closing and you want to do the crash, uh, protection as part of it. And you want to do the, where you place the hinges as part of it. And as part of wear and tear durability and all of these things as a single problem and have the system redefine itself that that doesn't exist but it will exist no and that doesn't ex that, that doesn't year. exist for just the door i mean it could yeah. exist for the entire vehicle because you also have heat Eventually. and cold so if the door the dynamics and everything it's it's, 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 gonna, it's all going to be the yeah. computer and and the computer will have an objective the objective will be gas mileage lower cost car and then you could move the dial and tell the ai listen this car is for military purposes what we want is it for it to be rugged. We don't care about gas mileage. We care about how rugged it is and the and the life cycle of it. And if it's going to be able to withstand, you and know, you do a, a simulation, yeah, an IED you, attack. You, and then well, for a, a Tesla, you might say, I, I want this thing to have the greatest uh, efficiency for an electric vehicle. So it being light and it being, uh, you know, aerodynamic becomes more important. Correct. Yeah, making it, you know, the, the space plan for how much space you have inside the vehicle like the, uh, and, and how roomy uh, it is and storage. That you, that's your sort of package protection. And then from there, you, you start to define the rest of the system. It, that type of software capability doesn't exist today, but we're, we're going to be there in, in a decade for sure. There's and, no, no question in my mind. And, it, and it, the example that comes to mind for me is when we grew up, you and I are both Gen Xers. I don't know if you had this experience where they brought us to the assembly hall and we watched the space shuttle take off and land every time. Um, but the the tragedy, and I, I'm not going to remember which the names of each of them. I know one was, I believe, the Challenger. Uh, one of them blew up uh, tragically on takeoff because of, I believe, an O-ring. And the other one yeah. um, um, came apart in reentry because of tiles, which couldn't withstand the heat. And in those well, two, the, in, is that correct? The, the insul yeah, the insulation uh, on takeoff hurt uh, one of the one of the leading edges, and then that that uh, cascaded uh, piece that cascaded in the reentry. Yeah, and, and and so in in if this technology had existed back then, this software that thinks holistically about the outcome that you're looking for, which is to protect the souls on board the space shuttle, on the vehicle at all cost. It's potential, it, it, there is a, a very high potential that both of those could have been avoided because a lot of these errors that happen in aerospace are cascading errors that cannot be uh, predicted or extremely hard to predict when one person's working on the nut and the bolt and the other person's doing the O-ring and yet another person's doing the wiring uh, for, you know, the television sets on the back of the airplane seats, Correct. I mean, I think uh, it's going to be a while till we can do systems the size of a space shuttle because that, that's a quite a complicated uh, system. But I think that the that uh, yeah, I mean, it's we're definitely going to be within our lifetimes uh, in, in a setup where software will be able to design uh, in context very large systems and and uh, do simulate multi-physics simulation and put a, a safety factor uh, across the full system. So that that will exist. Uh, um, how many customers um, ballpark does desktop metal have at this time? Hundreds. Hun hundreds. Uh, great. Yeah. When we get back from this commercial break, uh, and the company is in year five? It's uh, almost five. Almost Four five, right? Something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I'm, 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 I'm have a very weird gift of like, understanding the time but only for startups i can't i don't know how yeah. many years i've been married <laughs> but I, I, I always remember when the startups were uh this is a problem i have to get a tattoo of, of my uh of, of our wedding day because my wife and i are like are we 13 years or 14 years or 15 years i don't know it's been it's been 18 wonderful years together uh, when we get back from this break i want to understand why you took this opportunity to do the SPAC because SPACs have become a relatively new uh, phenomenon that were 
previously not available and, and really not that interesting, but Bill Gurley himself, our mutual friend, uh, and Chamath, our mutual friend, they both have now become enamored uh, and leader sh leaders in thinking about new ways to get companies going public and reverse totally. the horrible trend of less companies being public and retail investors having less access to startups in the early stages of them. I want to talk about why you chose the SPAC and what you think of the overall market of companies going public earlier than they had, but just like they used to in the 80s and 90s when we get back on This Week in Startups. All right, we all know the way we are working together has changed overnight. We've all gone from going to offices and commuting to working from home. And if there's one thing we've learned, it's that you need the right resources and you're going to need to adapt. And Fiverr is a great way for you to solve your acute business needs right now. 2020 has been full of all this uncertainty uh, and finding the right talent can be time consuming frustrating and expensive. Don't I know it? It's really hard to find great people. Uh, and your business is probably very dynamic. You might need new things done that you didn't need done previously because of uh, the unique situation we're in. So Fiverr's Marketplace will connect you with businesses and freelancers who offer hundreds of digital services. You know, the copywriting, graphic design, developers, film editing, whatever it is. You need to make an explainer video. You want to make a new landing page. You're going to get it done with Fiverr. F-I-V-E-R-R -R is the website you're going to go to. It's really amazing because they have all the reviews there and they tell you people's availability. So you can find somebody and get the price ahead of time. Fiverr takes the friction and the annoyance out of finding a freelancer. It's really the best way to explain it. They have 24-7 customer service and a network of quality talent. We use it here all the time at Long. Um, and it's really been great for research. That's like, I think, a secret thing people don't know. When you check out at Fiverr.com, you will receive 10% off if you use the code TWIST. Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. Use that code TWIST so they know that I sent you. I know you don't need to save 10%, but please go ahead and thank Fiverr on Twitter for supporting the show. And go ahead and when you use the service, please, the first time, use that code TWIST. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, Rick Fulop is with us, the uh, CEO and founder or co-founder. I don't know if you're a solo founder or co-founder on no this founder. one. Co-founder. No, no, I got. We have, have a couple. Uh, four, I got four MIT professors as co-founders who are dear friends, and then uh, Jonah Meyerberg, uh, Rick Chin, other folks are co-founders of the company as well. So yeah, it, and it really has been. You've moved at a very fast pace with this company. From from yeah, iteration to getting it to market, product market fit. I just remember early you sending me text saying, "We just got this client. We just got this client. This 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 thing might work." You had very early success with customers, huh? Yeah, it it was. Uh, we knew what we wanted to build, so we we had been uh, uh, to some extent uh, investing in this space and and uh, knew the knew the market. Uh, uh, had been using the technology for a long time before this. And, uh, uh, you know, so it was uh, definitely an, an area where we have experience. Yeah. I mean, I think that's super yeah. helpful. So um, let's and, talk and about... We, knew, we, we yeah. knew customers. So, you know, knowing customers uh, is, is a big deal. I mean, having relationships, early adopters, and uh, that that is a, definitely a... a you, you, you work with people to de develop a product for them, and that that is uh, definitely helpful. It's a huge advantage when you know the customer, you understand their needs, and they trust you. Uh, and totally. trust is a big part of this because they huge. have to trust you in order to write a two, three, four, five, ten million dollar check for a, a, a hardware product that is in your head right now and is in a mock up essentially, right? I mean, people were totally. putting deposits down for things that did not yet exist, if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And you're not the only person who's ever done that, by the way. Elon took famously, you know, he was able to help fund the company through the deposits. I, it, he did, did that a great job, yeah. And did a great job at it, our mutual friend. And, um, and you, did you deploy that same tactic? Was was taking customer deposits uh, in order to fund the company uh, one of the strategies here? Uh, we did take deposits uh, like like that as, as aggressively, but we we knew what we wanted to build and we went at it at full speed. And uh, you know, we had a couple of twists and turns early on. Do we do it this way? Do we do that? And then eventually, pretty quickly, settled that we wanted to sort of redefine powder metallurgy, but for three D printing. And 
you know, sort of separate the thermal processing from the shaping of the parts. And that would allow you to print parts uh, in an office environment or a hundred times faster than the legacy technology. And, uh, you know, you, you make something a hundred times faster and you make parts at 120th the cost of a previous process. And the, the market is huge. You know, we make uh, $12 trillion worth of parts every year. And uh, $12 trillion worth of parts are made with desktop metal equipment. No, 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 no. Twelve trillion dollars. I was like, that's not possible. In the world, in the world, world. world. that's your TAM. So we're not there yet. I was like, wait, this doesn't make any sense. What are you? Are you actually printing money? (laughs) Are you printing coins with it? (laughs) Please don't use it for forgery. (laughs) I know desktop metal has some very elegant technology. Do not three D print a quarter. That's not allowed. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the SPAC process. Sure. I'm sure you were under a lot of pressure with this early success with the bankers circling and saying, hey, here's the traditional process. And those banks are very aggressive and they like to wine and dine founders. So you have them over here, I'm sure, you know, trying to get in early and and as having been a venture capitalist and having had other success, they're like circling. Yeah. And then you have the direct listing thing over here and you're watching Spotify do that and you're watching Bill Gurley's blog post and tweets. And then you see our friend Chamath uh, basically restart the SPAC movement. And I, and I think we have to give him a lot of credit for doing that. He deserves all the credit. 100%, right? This is yeah. like SPAC equals Chamath brought it back. I remember sitting at the poker table with him when he explained it to me. And I was like, you got to explain it to me two more times. I don't, I'm too stupid to understand this. And he did to his credit. So you're watching the three options. Explain to me as a founder, your assessment of each one and why you chose as our friend Bill Gurley wrote in uh, Above the Crowd, his amazing blog, if you don't read every post, you're an idiot. This is like literally the freest knowledge from one of the most brilliant investors in history, Above the Crowd, just Google it. He just wrote door number three. You pick door number three. Tell me about door number one and door number two and door number three and what the process is in your mind of which door to pick. Okay, so I've done the door number one. I, I took a company public with you know, the top investment bankers, uh, Morgan Stanley and Goldman back in 09. And we did the whole thing. And it was a great experience. And uh, it took a long time. And, you know, you, you know, it's like a year of preparation, 07 through 08. And then the 08 crisis happened. And then the bankers delay you a year. And it's like, you don't have any control of the process, which is not great. Um, but then eventually you go out and then you're done. Uh, it, and then that approach, you do your SEC work first, like the the, the paperwork that you submit and all that stuff and you get your s1 you, you're effective once you're done through your ipo and then uh, get your comments and all that um in the uh it takes a long time and it's a definitely a, an involved process there also the, is a criticism of that process from bill Gurley that huge. the banks get uh a little bit uh the, the alignment is not perfect maybe you could you could speak to that maybe not in your deal but just in general yeah, in deals i, I can Oh, you can't, yeah, or, or in terms of your deal, what happened? Yeah. Well, uh, well, back in 2009, when we did our, our uh, when I did a regular IPO, I, we left $380 million on the table, basically from underpricing. Explain how like, that happened and then what the next six months are like for you grinding your teeth thinking about that. How do you I, leave 380 on the table? Honestly, I didn't think about it afterwards. And oh, because you were I rich, it right? <laughs> it was like a big win. <laughs> right, Bill no, Gurley's looking across 100 IPOs. This is your first, so you're yeah, just yeah, like yeah. happy to be so public. I, I mean, like, we're like, thank God we got through the thing. It was so much work. Oh, my goodness. Uh, but um, but the stock went uh, out at, at what dollar and then what did I mean, it hit I, peak at? at I, can't even remember. I can't even remember. It was like from like uh, 14 bucks to 18 or something like that. Anyway. The, the so that spread, that, you should have you should have captured that spread, yeah, as opposed to the bank or their you know best friends who got the allocations. Best friends. It's really the, the way that it works is it was the best friends that would traditionally capture the spread in a regular IPO, and and I remember meeting the best friends in the roadshow, and then the regular people, and then you, when the allocation comes, the book is open, and there's some transparency, but it it is they do un, I mean there is some underpricing in order to guarantee demand and ensure that it's a successful offering and then how much pop is, you know, I guess it depends on PR and other, other sort of interest from the investor community, et cetera. So anyway, w- I think that every, every entrepreneur was okay with that spread, but they, they are leaving money on the table and it is, it is what it is. Then Bill and other folks started looking at this direct listing thing. Uh, they made a lot of uh, hay with it. And the problem with direct listing 
that, that's when the company literally just does the work themselves and lists themselves uh, is that um, it's there is there is no um, you're not able to raise primary capital as part of the direct listing. And so that was a limitation of it. And, and uh, I remember meeting in January at, at World Economic Forum with the vice chair of the New York Stock Exchange uh, and John Tottle and asking him, how can we do a direct listing? And uh, we've got cash in the balance sheet and we, you know, we'd be a great candidate for it and we could start to do other things that we want to do. Uh, and the problem with it was in direct listing, you have to wait a certain amount of time before you can raise capital after the direct listing. Uh, and so there's some limitations to it. And um, it, John was working on, on with the SEC to try to come up with a, a mechanism that would allow you to raise primary capital as part of a direct listing. Usually when a company goes public, they're trying to raise primary capital. You try to sell yeah. shares to long-term holders, hopefully. But of course, these friends of the banks, they're just flipping it. They're buying it for 14, selling it for 18, or maybe they sell half their position. And you really want long-term holders. Yeah, you, you want the long-only mutual funds. You want high-quality investors. Some of the friends of the bank are high-quality investors, but there's no mechanism for them to build a position when they get a, such a small amount of an IPO. So it's a, there's some complications to that, mm, uh, mm. To that uh, approach. Then, then the direct listing had that problem. Actually, last week, uh, actually on Wednesday, the same way that we went public, the, the SEC finally approved primary capital to get with direct listing. So it will right. be a thing. And it's a new thing. And, and I think Bill uh, tweeted to John on, on Twitter, just uh, thanking him for all his work to make that real. Um, and that's the most three. fair to all shareholders, because my understanding is when you do a direct listing, a feature or a bug or just a nuance of it is there is no more lockup period. You just the shares are tradable or do you have to write that in? It really depends. Every deal is different. Ah, uh, got it. You really want a lockup period so that you have a... a Why? Uh, Why is a lockup period important? Because new investors coming in, you know, want to feel like, like the public that's coming in want to feel like, like uh, somebody's, you know, there are no surprises. You want to have a little bit of time for the, for the public to see the company perform mm. and uh, see that, that what they said they were going to do is what they do and all of that. So, I mean, I think it's a... I mean, that's just my personal opinion. I, I think it speaks I, to I'm trust, a, right? I mean, you, you, yeah. you're you you're not, you're not saying you buy shares now, I sell shares now. You're saying you buy shares now and we're in it together. And I'm not going anywhere for some period of time. Uh, honestly, you know, I'm, I, I, I've, uh, I'm, not in, uh, I'm not a seller in our company, so I'm, I'm going to be a long-term holder in our company. Me Hopefully too. I'm doing this a, a decade from now. And, and uh, so I think uh, we're... we're um, but but in the in the you know there are, I think that that uh, in a direct listing you may need to create a float so some of the ones like Spotify or Slack may have uh, done it without a without a lockup anyway okay and then so time, now before we go to uh, w when we get back from this quick break now that we've do done door number one traditional process you leave money on the table it takes a heck of a long time and there's a little shenanigans perhaps going on uh, and great that you have it as an option but there are some shenanigans and inefficiencies that bill Gurley and other you know professors Mike Moritz, our, my, our friend mike he's been also very outspoken about it yeah so i mean the two most arguably the number one and number two most successful investors i mean you could we could, we could argue it but they're not rush more of, of venture capital are are, are are looking for change now we have this direct listing with uh, the ability to raise capital. So now there's competition, puts a little pressure on the banks to maybe make that first process a little bit better. When we get back from this break, we talk about door number three, which Desktop Metal chose. When we get back on This Week in Startups. Hey, everybody, you know Dell has been sponsoring This Week in Startups, and they've been a tremendous supporter of me for many years. And I have been a tremendous supporter of Dell's because I am obsessed with those big, curved, beautiful Dell monitors. I send them to every employee. Long story short, Dell for Entrepreneurs has really been trying to help every single one of our startups. And we're very lucky today have, to have Mobilaji. So come be uh, on the program and he runs Dell for Entrepreneurs. Tell us a little bit about what you do at Dell and why entrepreneurship is so important to the team at Dell. Yeah, Jason, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. Um, as you said, uh, name is Mobilaji Sukumi. 
I oversee strategic partnerships in the Center for Entrepreneurship for Dell Small Business in, in, in the US. And ultimately, we want to make sure that when it comes to technology solutions, small business owners and entrepreneurs can consider Dell as a preferred choice. Um, and currently, uh, with in, in terms of like you know COVID and what's going on currently in the market, um, we're making sure that we're having those conversations as more entrepreneurs and small business owners are looking more to uh, you know thrive and survive in the midst of this pandemic. We want to make sure that they can consider Dell as a preferred technology partner. Uh, I'm excited to be here, and you know to to your, to your question, um, entrepreneurship is important for us. Um, Dell, our DNA is built on entrepreneurship, right? We've been around for at least 35 years. And, you know, Michael Dell is one of the most iconic entrepreneurs out there. Amazing and so it makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense for us to work with entrepreneurs. Our DNA is embedded in entrepreneurship. And so that's why we we have this program. And that's why, you know, we, we're pretty excited about our partnership with Twist. Save up to 43% when you take an extra 5% off at launch.co slash Dell. And while you're there, you can also register for a free IT consultation and be entered in to win a $200 Amazon gift card. All right, it is a yum yum day for Jake Al, your boy. It's working hard. Uh, you know, I'm doing 100 investments a year and I'm just very lucky to have developed a friendship with Rick Phillip and and you know, you get that phone call from somebody on his level and you just say, "Where do I send the check?" And uh, I was lucky enough to be able to put a small bet on Desktop Metal and I am long the company. Uh, when I get my shares, I'm holding. I'm telling people right now, I don't know how this works when I get them distributed. Uh, we'll talk about that now here in the third segment. But um, I'm, I'm long Rick Fulop and I'm long desktop metal. Uh, I am an interested party. <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Uh, when did people start approaching you about the SPAC? When did you, uh, and then how did you make the decision to, to pick a SPAC and explain to people just generally what is a SPAC? Like, just like you explained the first two processes. So, uh, the a SPAC is a special purpose acquisition company, and it's a, a model where somebody, uh, they call it a promoter or, or a, a um, you know, manager, you know, a manager of a SPAC yeah. will go out and raise capital and build a, build a, a strategy around that and go and find a company that they can go and acquire after the, the SPAC is a publicly listed company. So, uh, you, you raise capital, you put it in a trust, you pay, um, you know, some, re you know, small interest uh, return to, to those investors. And then that, that manager will go out and search for a period of a year or two years or whatever the period uh, is, he'll go search for a company. And so that there's approximately $30 billion worth of SPAC capital in the market right now. Incredible. Is, uh, yeah. An increase from last year, an increase from the year before. Um, and it, it's been a while since this has existed. In the past, the people that did a SPAC or raised a SPAC or, you know, also known as a blank check company, they were quite rare and, and, uh, you didn't see, you didn't see high quality folks attached to them. What's really changed is since Jamath got involved, he has raised the quality of the people that are doing it. And you have people, um, now that, that are, uh, very high quality. Uh, managers uh, executing these strategies. You've got people like Mark Stata, Dragoneer, who's extremely high quality uh, person. You have uh, Bill, uh, Ack Bill whole, Ackerman. Is that his name? Bill, Bill Ackman is a very Ackman. very successful. Yeah, yeah. is you've got um, so so there's a range of, of very successful uh, folks that that are uh, put together these. Uh, you know, Roger Fraden, who is the vice chairman of Honeywell, is has got a SPAC and. There's, there's a whole actually, range of, so. we can, I'll pull up a chart right now. I'll show you. We, we actually have a chart of this. The number of SPACs created uh, now is uh, we had a big dip, obviously, after the financial crisis, but now we're at a peak. Uh, Nick, uh, is that 81 there? 81. 81 SPACs yeah. this year have been created, and we're only halfway through the year, so I'm going to assume that's going to double. I don't know. Is that is that so, 20? What year is that there, Nick? Is that 2018? 2020. That's 2020 with 81. So this thing's going to get more momentum. It probably ends the year over 120, I'm going to guess. Right, right now, there's 110 SPACs looking oh, okay. for, for deals. And wow. um, the, the reality is that, Incredible. Um, you know, they're specific to a segment and you got to find somebody that is, there's like a matchmaking process. So you, you get a board member with it. And in our case, we're really lucky to have uh, partnered with Leo Hendry. 
he was uh, the fellow that Leo Hendry. Well, he did land systems back in the day. Uh, actually, he's, he was he did uh, TCI and AT and T broadband and Liberty oh, that Media. Leo Hendry. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, yeah. I was thinking about another one. Leo Spiegel was that? Yeah, was, anyway, yeah, there's yeah, a lot yeah. of Leos going around this industry, so that's fantastic. So you find a high quality manager. He says, "I want to be involved," and he brings how much cash in his back? Whatever is in the trust. And so now it's not like an IPO. Uh, the trust, the cash has to stick in the trust. The people that are investors in the SPAC have to like the deal. You know, they 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 can have a proxy vote right before the mergers close, and uh, and then in order to backstop the deal in case there's redemptions, you raise what's called a pipe, uh, which private is private investment a, in public entity equity, entity? equity, yeah, equity, yeah. So that that is uh, where you get the mutual funds and the long only investors mm. to participate in the deal so you have the, the capital that was raised in the SPAC at once plus the capital that comes from the pipe uh, and together they form the full deal that gets announced and the pipe uh, allows you to have a much higher quality uh, group of investors that add add to the value of the of the of the total offering. So and you get to select uh, them. So that is like the original IPO process. It's sort of like skimming the cream of door number one. You get to say, "Hey, it, I want Fidelity. Is. I want Goldman. I want this bank for whatever reason." Our board was a, the allocation committee. We literally had we're super oversubscribed, and we sat down and said, "This guy and this guy and this gal." In this fund and that fund, wow! Uh, and and that those are the folks that and and you can actually give them a a uh, meaningful position so that they can build a a um, a longer longer term position in the company and that's that's a unique feature of this of this wow. approach. That's yeah. yet another benefit. Now tell me about the time frame because I have been researching this because I have been approached and I'm going to need your advice to SPAC what I do as an angel investor with the syndicate.com. And I'm think it's a brilliant idea, but I'm going to put that aside my personal consultation with you until we get to the end. But um, what is the time frame from when Leo contacts you and you're like, well, okay, here we go, Leo, this is a big name. I'm sure everybody else on the top Leo. of that list contacted you from yeah. when he contacts you to Wednesday, you know, uh, August 26, when this thing is announced, what's the time frame like? So before you do any of this, uh, you you spend two years making sure that your company is public ready. Right. And Define you, what you, that means. Public ready means what? I mean, you have to have PCAOB compliant financials. Uh, you have to have your audits done, just like a regular comp company going public. All that work needs to happen. You you can't just like flip a switch and then you're like, I mean, you, you have a significant amount of we're really lucky. Our, our finance team had done multiple IPOs before. They have been through the ringer. They have a public accounting background, so they know what they're doing. And so that that is a, one of the first requirements is that you're ready to go. Uh, otherwise, you know, so that's one part. And then you spend some time selecting a bank. Instead, of, It's not like Leo calls you. It, it doesn't work like venture. It, it's you, you sort of select an underwriter, and then once you have an underwriter, uh, and, and you want somebody who has experience in this sector, just like going through an IPO, then you you will uh, actually do a process where you go talk to a bunch of uh, SPACs that may be uh, a good fit to your process. And this is where it gets interesting. The SPACs want to continue to see deals nonstop, and they haven't done um, a you know they, they have to they have to do due diligence, mm. but at the same time they're doing due diligence for multiple companies. They're a search vehicle, right? So their job is to not be exclusive with anybody till the last minute. So one of the risks of doing a SPAC deal is that you can get stuck in a false positive or a false negative situation where you waste a lot of time with one thing and then like they leave you in the altar. And wow. that's not a, so, so that is, uh, you know, that's pretty risky for a company, right? You, you're doing, you got to lock up, lock yourself up, and you have to have the capability to like not, not end up in a in a bad process. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you you work with a bank that's good that will, you go meet with a number of, you, you present to a number of. First, you, you you get your 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 story straight, and then you go present to a number of of uh, uh, SPACs, and then you find somebody that you have a you you have a meeting of the minds with, and then once you that part of the process 
uh, you you have to uh, agree to go to the pipe market, which is the 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 rest of the financing uh, part of the process, and that is something that uh, at that point you you want to have agreed on on what the deal is with with the SPAC, uh, and uh, once you have a deal signed, an LOI signed with a SPAC, then you you go to the pipe market and you present your story for several weeks, so you know maybe three or four four months of process. Uh, so we're talking about maybe. 50, 60, 70% less time than door number one. That's a misnomer. It's not less time because you well, still well, you have just to know roadshow, right? No, you do have a, you do the roadshow is with the pipe. Ah, so if you didn't have the pipe and you just did a SPAC, then it would be saving time. But if you do the pipe, you've basically added back the roadshow. Well, you have, it's actually more work. So you have to first, you do your, your bake-off for the underwriter. Then you do the bake-off for the SPAC. Got it. Then you partner with a SPAC. Then you do the roadshow. But then after you announce, you have to do the SEC work, in, uh, like, like your S4. In a, in a IPO, you do something called an S1. And that, it takes a long time to prepare it. And here, you have to write an S4 and file it and do the comments process with the SEC. All that, that's just as much work as an S1 but you're doing it after the announcement as opposed to before you go out for the roadshow. So overall, this is not for like, uh, I mean, this is work. It's Okay, it's, so it may, uh, you have to be it ready may wind up being the same amount of work as door number one, which would then lead you yeah. to the question, if all things are equal, although Bill Gurley seemed to feel that door number three, the SPAC was faster, but I'm going to put that aside right now because this may be, you know, your mileage may vary kind of situation. Why pick door number three, SPAC, over door number one, traditional? If so it's the same time. Yeah, you definitely, uh, the underpricing is a real thing. And then uh, the, the, you're doing the S4 process after the announcement. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is some, I mean, you're, you're trading one thing for another. It, it is going to take you a good six months, no matter what. I mean, people say that it's faster. It's maybe, maybe it's faster, but, but uh, it's work. Which is All more stuff. painful? F is one more painful than the other? I mean, I understand one feels more fair. And for a founder, this is very important. I mean, in my mind, founders who build great companies have a, a North Star of when in, in business of things need to be fair for all parties. And I think the resentment that's built up around door number one is the unfairness of it. So clearly door number three and door number two feel much more fair than door number one. I mean... I think there's not there's nothing unfair about door number one. Door number one is a great process if you if you can do it. But it, you know the market what people don't understand is market window is not open all the time. Ah, and 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 you can do things some, some things sometimes and other things other times. And uh, just like there's uh, it's there's an open market window now for SPACs that wasn't available last year. And and the uh, it, you know, obviously Chamath opened that window with Virgin Galactic wide open for, for the whole market. So the entire market should thank him. Mm. Uh, he, he's a huge innovator in, in finance and uh, kind of walks on water. So I would say he, he definitely uh, created a market. Uh, and uh, a lot of a lot of folks in, in the SPAC space have, have kind of uh, benefited from from his uh, work. Mm. Uh, I would say... Um, uh, you know, Bill, Bill Gurley wasn't talking about SPACs six months ago, right? He's, no, he, no, he went, we, we all sat at so. the poker table together and he, w he was a big fan of the direct listing, but I think even he yeah, concedes yeah. now, <laughs> listen, anything is better than leaving money on the table. And he's very, well, there's no, there's no doubt in my mind. And I have no inside information here, even though we're talking honestly, about two of my there's good nothing friends. Wrong with, there's nothing wrong with leaving money on the table. The, if Sometimes the IPO, IPO is a great process too. It's all, they all have warts and pimples. There is a lot of ups and downs with this fact process. I mean, you know, the, the, it's a high stakes negotiation process with, with the SPAC sponsor. And then when, on the, during the pipe, uh, you know, it, it, like in the draft kings example, uh, my, I, I don't have direct information on this, but my understanding is that they had a difficult time with the pipe negotiation and the ah. pipe folks colluded on them, lowered wow. the price of the deal. And then even after that happened, the, the deal ran up to, you know, significant, uh, mm. uh, boom after the, after the deal had been done. So it, you know, it, th the these are, still uh, out, let's say, but now there's more options. Yeah. So the fact there's that there's more three options. more options equals better. And you have more control of your life in a SPAC process for sure. 
How in so? IPO How so? Well, I, I feel like in the IPO process, uh, because the window for IPO is is somewhat, uh, um, you know, in, in the past it was Montgomery Securities and Hambrick and Quist and uh, Robbie Stevens and all these specialized small company underwriters that were credible ways for a company to get public. And uh, as there was consolidation on the bank side, the rules kept going up. Now you have to have a billion dollar market cap. Now you have to have like X, X revenue broker. Now you have to have this, now you have to have that. And it's made it such a small universe of, of folks that actually can get through that Rubicon that it's a, a um, you know, it, it's, it's what you were describing that, that, you know, there's less public companies today than there were a decade ago. And it's, it's a shame that, that uh, you know, uh, retail investors can't get into Microsoft the way that they did in 1986, where or they Apple, bought Microsoft or Google or yeah, it, it, you know Google. Went, I mean, people don't Google went uh, Amazon. These companies, they, they, I mean, the fact that Uber took so long, you know, with 10 billion in revenue, whatever. I mean, Airbnb's taking for Airbnb taking so goddamn long that they've got uh, options expiring. I mean, nobody ever thought that would become a situation. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a mess. And, it's and a I mess. think uh, it, it is, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, you have other other situations that that, that uh, there's sort of a vilification of, of being a public company, it, making it sound like it's it's an incredibly, I mean, some founders uh, uh, don't want to do it just from the perception of that they don't really know what they don't know. But uh, uh, I mean, it's like everything else, you got to deliver your numbers and make your quarters and execute properly. And uh, if you build a good business, you can raise money in the private market. And if you get build a good business, you should be able to go public. And and so this you know, fear of scrutiny. A- I mean, I, this next this next generation and their fear of scrutiny. It's basically our generation. The Gen, the Gen Xers have this fear of like scrutiny. I think this comes from the fact that all of these, uh, you know, uh, non traditional players said, "I'll take a hundred million." I'll take 250 million. Yuri Milner being one of the first, you know, Masayoshi san coming in. A lot of folks started dipping down into this venture space and saying, you know what? And and I kind of made the joke on CNBC, like just do a Mas IPO, you know, like Mas will IPO you. But we see that sometimes that doesn't exactly put enough sunlight on the company, i.e., we work. So what you're telling me is that scrutiny, that discipline makes for better companies correct i think so yeah yeah uh okay I mean, it, 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 it is a it is a uh i think that the reason we had this late stage boom was you know first it made you know it, you had less banks less ba- less ways to get out uh when there was consolidation on the banking side and and surveillance oxley and and all other, other things that made it more difficult to be public and then that led to um you know the the exits being more kind of packaged and at higher price. And then when that started happening, you had kind of a, 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 a void that, that got filled by people like Massa and other folks that, that with this sort of late stage, I'm going to keep you a unicorn forever situation. Uh, and uh, that, that is, there's a benefit to that. But, but I, I think uh, we've sort of robbed the, the retail investor and the public, the ability to get into growth, uh, high growth stocks. I agree 100%. And I also think, you know, if you, if you have more choices, if the Robinhood trader and full disclosure were early investors in Robinhood as well, maybe that'll be the fourth or fifth unicorn. I don't have any insight. Vlad, I, I remember going to a meeting with Vlad in uh, like in nine, uh, 2017. Wow. And uh, he was, he showed up at this meeting where everybody's like suited up. He showed up in like short shorts. Uh, nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the Tesla short yeah, shorts the, <laughs> with the Tesla logo on them. <laughs> it was the greatest well, troll you know, ever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I mean, it would be great for the Robin Hood investor to be able yeah. to say, hey, here's a company, you know, called Airbnb and it's worth $4 billion, yeah. And yeah. I stayed in one. Or here's this company, LinkedIn, and it's, you know, I hired somebody off of it. Or my cousin is driving for Lyft and my other, my brother totally. is doing Postmates. I, I think I would like to buy 10 shares of that and buy those shares when the company's at two, three, four billion, not 20, 30, 40 billion and be, and be able to bag a 10x. The retail totally. investors should be able to bag a 10x, you yes. know? And, and it's yes. unfair that like, you know, the, the, they don't have that opportunity. And when we were coming up in the industry, 
I, what was the benchmark back in the day? 50, 100 million in revenue, you go public? Something in that range? Roughly 50, you know, I think 50 to 100. Yeah. I mean, we took, I mean, I was an investor uh, uh, through, through um, uh, my friend Michael Scott, my partner Michael Scott, uh, had backed a company called Demandware that we ended up selling sure. to, uh, to um, Salesforce for like uh, close to 3 billion. But uh, we were the Series A investor in that business and we took it public in like 40 something million in revenue. And mm. it was a, you know, great. They kept running up and built a great public business. Uh, but it's a, uh, uh, you know, it, you got to have more of those successes, I think. Yeah, and people should be able to take risk. I mean, the, the idea that the only bet you can make in the stock market is on Amazon and Apple and Disney, which are fantastic companies. But we need more innovation. We need to have, I would love to see 10 times as many companies go public and let the public make some bets. And I'm using the word bet here. Let's let's face it, you know, we're, we're taking risk. Uh, uh, hopefully, it's an intelligent bet. But let 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 the average the average Joe, average Jane get in there and, and place a hundred dollar bet on Uber in year one. Uh, I'm sorry, not year one, year year five, you know, year four instead of year ten. Uh I would like to see well, people were, be able to take more risk. Jason, at year five for Uber, they were a indisputed uh massive Category company leader. that's like I mean they 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 were, they deserve to be public when they were five years old. I don't know why. I mean, this is more about Travis not I think Travis didn't want to do it. You know him better. Yeah, but, I think uh, I think a lot of it was, you know, I'll, and, and and it's better for Travis to answer his thinking on it. But I think at that time, things were going so unbelievably well that going public would mean showing people the playbook before yeah. they had reached all the markets, and sure. that to me made sense. If you think that you have a clear path to a, a hundred billion. $250 billion company turning over your cards. It's like, it's like in poker, you, you know, you flop a, a set and you're like, look, I got a set of tens and the other person's got two, you know, uh, the other person's on a flush and a straight draw all of a sudden, and eh, you maybe gave people a little too much information and they can, they can maybe chase it. Maybe they'll chase the straight, chase the flush and you, you created a competitor. Um, and so mm -hmm. that, I think that reason uh, is one. Um, what happens now for uh, shareholders of desktop metal, i.e. myself, when do I find out that I have how my shares and what their prices is and am I locked up? Uh, just technically, what what happens to, uh, you know, employees who have shares? How does that all happen in a SPAC? Is just the same as a, a public company same at some point? IPO. Yeah. At some yeah, point, you, you ship it to me, ship me some shares? Well, it's a, there's a conversion ratio from shares of one to the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our case, we had an up round uh the, <gasps> meaning that yum the price yum. at which we did yeah the price at which we did our deal is higher than the last financing and so oh, yum yum. Uh, we have yeah it's it was good and then uh uh you know employees and investors have a lockup which is a fair thing for the public markets yeah <laughs> lock me please lock me up for 10 years in any rick full up startup i mean i still have a bad thing well, around half my shares of, of uber uh, you know, yeah like, i mean uh jason if you look at our space it's been compounding for 20 years uh at 20 percent, and then the next uh the last three years is, is started compounding at twenty five percent, and it's projected to compound this decade at twenty five percent. So, in in our particular market, it was twelve billion dollars last year. It's projected to be one hundred and forty six billion by the end of the decade. And yeah, I'm not I, going anywhere. I'll hold it for a decade. Sure, it's a it's a it's a better market to be in than like uh, I don't know some public utility thing that's like uh, flat yeah. or uh, you know some energy uh, something like yeah deprecating. Exactly. So, <laughs> Be careful. Yeah, so it's a growth, it's a growth area in the industry. And obviously it's technology and, and, you know, with technology comes disruption and all these other things. But, but I think that, uh, if you're the disruptor in a technology market that's going to grow 11 X in a decade, it's a great area, uh, to, to be in. I think every venture firm is going to basically look at their portfolio and say, we're going to create a SPAC department and we're just going to every year fire off a SPAC with our LPs and whoever else wants to join the party. And you'll see Sequoia have like every year, Sequoia will launch every six months, a Sequoia, a benchmark, you know, just like Chamath has. I don't you know. know. You don't think so? I don't know. Is it too no, much, too different, too much work? I don't believe that you're allowed to know what you're going to acquire before you create a, a vehicle. No, you're uh, not allowed so to know. You can have a short list. And uh, it's, it's complicated. It, it, the, the economics 
mm. there is enough SPACs in the market that you could actually negotiate the the promote economics. Uh, in That's the, what I heard. What what does the promoter make? Because I know in Chamath's case, he put a lot of his own money in. But putting Chamath aside, what does a promoter get? I was told by somebody who came to me about was like wanted to sell me on starting a SPAC myself. They said it's like five to ten million dollars to set up a SPAC. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I heard. I mean, it, it, it's all dependent. It's it's like in a venture fund, you have carry, you have 20% as the normal carry in a venture fund. I think that 20% uh, is the promote in a, in a SPAC. So the, the sponsor makes a percent. Or actually, it's usually not one person. It's like a whole team of people. And, right. And it, 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 there's work and, and to do it right. And So if they were to put in $100 million, they get 20% of whatever that grows into. So if the 100 million were to grow into 1.1 billion, you take out the original 100 million and then you get 20% of the billion dollar in gain, you get no. 200 million. No, 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 it's not as good as venture. No. Not as good as it's venture. A, they get 5%, no. what do they get? No, they get 20% of the 100 million. Ah, in shares or in, in cash? In equity dilution of the company they're acquiring. Ah, got it. So they would then, if they put the hundred million and get twenty million in shares, if it ten x is, they get two hundred million, or the value yes. of those shares would be two hundred million. That's actually more that's alignment, cool. right? That's that's good alignment for them. I mean, yeah, but think about it. It's a twenty million dollar fee, so there's some expense to it. So, like the benefit yeah. here is, uh, you get added dilution, right? So you 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 have to make up for it, and uh, you can make up for it with a higher price, or you can make up for it with a. Uh, uh, hmm. it, I mean, it's not it's not as straightforward in an IPO, you don't have that dilution yeah. and you don't have a new board member. So you have to, so those are trade-offs. And, uh, mm. in our particular case, uh, we, you know, we, we felt like, like w it would be a huge asset to the company to have Leo. Oh, involved you think? With us. Yeah. So amazing. It's a, he's, he's an, uh, he's a legend. And, and, uh, uh, I think, uh, we were, uh, you know, that, that promote economics is something that can be negotiated, uh, there are different aspects of it can be negotiated. Uh, it's not like Chamath is in need of a quick hit, you know, and make a couple of milli. He wants to go long, you know, he's, he's looking to go long. He's not trying to, I, it, that's my best guess. I don't, I haven't asked him. It'd be a little uncouth for me to ask him directly. I mean, he's, he's, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know the economics of IPO, B and C that the other two or, or a, I mean, I think, but, but I think he's a major investor in, in those companies. So he's, major, he's actually, yeah. Skin in the game. A major backer. Yeah, totally. That's what I think is important to skin in the game. You know, when people see me doing my syndicates, they know that I'm a certain percentage of my funds and that my funds are putting money in. So we're not just, you know, like there were some people who were doing syndicates in the early days of AngelList who were like putting in 2K and raising 500K. <laughs> and people were like, is that the right ratio of skin in the game? And, you know, just, you know, it's, it's definitely an open discussion. I mean, obviously people can do that. You may have seen the accreditation laws are um, evolving now to the point at which uh, the SEC is now going to allow, re let's say, non-accredited investors to have a path to becoming sophisticated, i.e. Uh, accredited. What do you think that will have? What impact will that have on the, the startup game? I mean... Uh, I think that most people at Angel Invest are, are, are uh, I've never met a non-accredited angel investor yet. And, uh, but it, I think that, that, and I know you're a huge believer and I, I, I remember from reading your book, you, I think it's a, I think it would be awesome for, for a broader part of market to be able to be yeah. exposed to early stage investing. So yeah, it's just a I, great way to learn, right? Like if you're the it, HR person. Yeah, as long as it's done in a way that it's uh, that it's you know, the problem is early stage investing is quite quite risky. So yeah, eighty percent chance of a zero, ninety percent chance of a zero. Like be be prepared. So you need to hit like I think somewhere in the twenty, thirty, forty range is what most people tell me in terms of diversification to have a chance at an outlier. And that's a, and I mean that's a chance of an outlier. Um, and what I what what I'm proposing. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I mean, people have seen publicly, I've been talking to the SEC publicly on Twitter about this. I'm proposing that my Angel University course and my book be a path to, and this was my, my end game three years ago and why I wrote the book is I want the book plus the course, the three-hour course, which is free. Um, I, you know, just make a hundred dollar donation to charity or proceeds go to charity. Uh, everybody knows the rules. Uh, and so my idea is we could create a course 
and then do a 25 question certification, just like when you go buy a pistol, you have to take a gun certification, like you answer 25 questions about, you know, like how to store a pistol. Um, this would be amazing if we could do that. And then I think caps are the solution. So just like when we sell guns, we say, hey, you, you can only have this many, uh, the magazine can have this many bullets in it. I'm proposing a similar idea for early stage investors, which is you can make up to 5% of whatever was on the, the average of your last two, um, you know, tax filings. So let's say you made $75,000 a year for the last two years, you could do 5% of that, you know? So you can put 3,700, whatever, round it up $4,000. Maybe it's 10%, you know, it's people's money. But when you go to a casino in Vegas or you go to your local bookie and you do, you know, a cash-based bet at your bar, which everybody's doing anyway, we all know that. Nobody's saying, can I see your tax return? And it, can you float this bet? Or it's just going to be the next six weeks of your salary. And, uh, you know, I'm after going to send a guy, you know, to, to pick up the money, you know, like nobody's doing that. I, I say- let them invest, but then put it on the syndicate leads to get a confirmation with them where they say, I made this much money the last two years. I sign off that I'm, you know, my salary is $80,000. And we say, great, $80,000. You agree that you will not invest more than $8,000 in startups a year. And you agree that you'll do no more than you'll, you'll have some diversification or so, just something. It would be like if you went into a Vegas casino and you went into the high roller suite and they'd be like, do you belong in the high roller suite? Because it's 5,000 a hand for blackjack here. Are you sure you should be sitting at this table uh, and playing four hands of blackjack with your 20K? Like, probably not. Yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, I'm, I'm more a little more libertarian from the, from the view that, that people should be able to invest in what they want to invest in, I think, yeah. uh, and, and not have rules that prevent them from investing in things. I mean, if you want to start a company and you want to, but, but everybody's different. I think that, you know, it's probably healthy for the market to have some, some limits. I haven't thought about, about, you know, what, what's the right thing to do. Uh, I'm libertarian it too. It, the problem with our libertarian view is that there are bad actors sure. and, you know, in, in the, in a world filled, in a world filled with bad actors, I am concerned because I've watched people I know who are complete utter dipshits trying to sell angel investing scams and uh, these idiots who have never like literally this dipshit idiot. I'm not going to mention his name is talking about, I kid you not, Rick, what the angel investors in Uber made in selling like a $3,000 angel investing course. That person didn't invest. He basically took my book. He took my track record and made a Fukaka crazy, you know, money making scam for three thousand dollars. And you know that you pay like five hundred now, and then they try to upsell you three thousand. If you're that goddamn rich, number one, don't ride on my coattails or my investments. Yeah. And then number two, oh, if you've made that much money, why are you trying to scam young, you know, young kids out of three thousand dollars like all these lame people? I my a angel, the book is nine dollars. Everything I learned in the first, you know, whatever seven eight years of angel investing, nine dollars. And then the course is a hundred dollars. All the proceeds go to charity. Like anybody who's rich who's trying to s sell you on a book or a scam or a thousand or a three thousand dollar course on how to get rich is by definition not rich because they need the money from you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go on a tangent, yeah, Rick, but you're my friend. Point, yeah. It's just, it's very frustrating for me when I see people doing this bad stuff. Um, just wrapping up, thank you for including me uh, on the ride. Um, we've had a great ride. Absolutely. And how great would it have been if Dine, if SPACs were around, if uh, 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 Dine, oh my Lord. Well, actually, <sighs> I, I really think that Dine, Dine could have been public. I, I've always told uh, Kyle and Jeremy and the rest of the team, but you know, they- they, they got a great uh, offer. They got a great offer and they're, you know, part of Oracle and it's a great, that was a fantastic exit for everybody. And yeah, uh, so yeah. makes me sad. I mean, everybody, everybody, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, there's, there's yeah. a, it, it's a full, uh, I mean, everyone, look. <laughs> Everybody's a, at different points in life. Like we're, we're yeah. talking about people cashing their chips in, in different ways at different moments in their life. Right. Yeah. And that was a long journey. 
But I oh, just, yeah. I think one of the things that we need to think about in the United States, especially when it comes to finance, is that we've created so much goddamn regulation and we made this all so complex. And we've got this patriarchal, you know, like we, we're going to treat everybody like babies with, you know, the, the, the less money you make, the more we treat you like a baby and the less access we give you to wealth creation devices is just bonkers. And then this is what's creating this, a, a big part of the tension is, well, I can't get in on the deals that an accredited investor can in, you know, in, in the early part of our careers, you and I could not have invested in the companies we're investing in building now. And that's just unfair. We should make it fair. Let everybody have access to these companies. And uh, I'm really glad that you went public um, because I do think it's, um, you know, you're just a tremendous entrepreneur. And I like the fact that, you know, you didn't wait another five years. Like you're doing it. A I wouldn't say you're doing it early. You're in year five or getting to hit year five. That's what we used to do in this town, right? Five yeah. years seemed to be the time to do it. So you're just doing it like we used to do it. Congratulations. Thank you for Thank coming you, on the friend. pod. And awesome. uh and if I see you, I know that you you know that there's you have zero budget constraints to where you stay. If I see you in the Bay Area and it's not at my house, I'm coming picking you up at the Four Seasons of St. Regis. <laughs> you you tell Why? me what you, I I'm making a new I'm making a new smoked. <laughs> I'm smoking uh pork belly along with the brisket. It's a nice combo. So next time you're in I town, Cala Compound. By the way, I don't yes, know if sir. you remember, but your dad is the one who taught me how to do barbecue. So I had no idea what I was doing till uh, your my dad, dad did to teach you. That's right. That's right. I think when we were in Nantucket, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I'm thinking about getting a place in Nantucket uh, because come and join us. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I just I I like the East Coast. The East Coast. I miss my East Coast vibe. When I'm on Nantucket, I've never been so relaxed in my life. I like getting it's the awesome. Jeep, and I like going off road. Yeah, people don't know you fine. can do this. Now, do you have the badge to go off road with your Jeep or no? Yeah, you have yeah, yeah. You just do the, the driving. I yeah. love it. I love driving out. What's that point you drive out to? A uh, great point. Yeah. We drove out there, me, you, and Jeremy, I think, that day. I don't know if oh, did, yeah. did you come on that with was me, you, and Jeremy? I did. I did. Yeah. And we, yeah. we drove the Jeeps all the way out to the lighthouse, and the sea yeah. lines were tracking us the whole time. And what, you drive out to that point, and it takes, what did that, that takes like half an hour to get to the end of the point. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a big, it's a long trip, but and you it's got, fun. Yeah. It's fun, and you and you, it's fun, and at the, you have to lower the air pressure on your tires so you don't get stuck in the sand. I gotta yeah. get, I'm getting myself one of them Jeep Wranglers, man. I love that. Yeah. That was one. That was peak experience, I have to say. And awesome. uh, you know, much love to the family, and uh, thank you for. Uh, the friendship over the years and for including me in the ride and uh, yeah, thanks uh, for the support. Yeah. yeah 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 many more deals to come all right i, I love you rick congratulations for sincerely uh, all right we'll see you all next time on this week in service bye bye